Um, ik denk dat we contact hebben. Hallo, uh, Mr. Rashi, can you, can you hear us? Yes, I hear you very well. Wonderful. <laughs> Terribly nice of you to join us. Um, we've been having a conversation uh, just up until now with two Dutch writers, Aziz Ainan and Chris Kolemans, about your work and about your recent uh, book, which came out uh, this week, um, Knife. <laughs> And we're sitting here uh, uh, together in the Bali. We're very, very happy that you join us. I believe you're joining us from New York. Is that right? That's right. I'm joining you from my home in New York. Um, thank you very much for uh, um, uh, uh, coming back to uh, uh, to us. Um, we um, we have been discussing your book, and it's it's a um, uh, uh, it's a. Uh, uh, a very layered book. It's um, an excellent book, we thought. So many, so many styles in it. So many, um, uh, and so very, very personal, <laughs> of course. Um, you write it in the first person. I heard you. Yeah. I heard you say something like, "Yes, uh, being knifed is a very personal first-person experience." Yeah, I mean, some, it, first of all, it's it's very physically close. You know, the the attacker is very close to you. And indeed, for some of the time after I fell down, he was actually on top of me. Uh, you don't get much closer than that. Um, and so I felt it had to be a first-person book. It was, it was too intimate an experience, in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very intimate. Um, uh, and you said um, the attacker, which you, you don't name your attacker in the book, you called him... Uh, uh, the A, uh, which in Dutch is the aanvaller, or the in English would be the attacker, um, and many other things, and the ass uh, as well. Um, um, you also say that this 27 seconds of fame, that's all he had. Huh? Um, very intimate, 26, 20, uh, 27 seconds. Um, it reminded me, in many ways, of what you write in uh, uh, Joseph Anton uh, about uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini when he is dying and in his dying moments sort of does another cruelty by trying to be famous on the account of a famous writer yourself. Um, this is sort of a, a very disturbing thing that, that, that people in the world try to be famous by attacking art. Yeah, well, Khomeini was famous anyway, to be fair. To be fair, um, yeah. <laughs> All right. But he was dying, so he was clinging on to his fame. Yes, yes. I, unfortunately, <laughs> I became his, his, last, his last gesture. Um, and, you know, we live in a violent time. And, and, you know, America has become such a violent place that murder is commonplace. Um, uh, mass murder is commonplace. And I think in, in, in some ways, this is a very American crime. It's a young man who born and raised in New Jersey, living in a world in which murder is casual um, and every day, and maybe finds it easier to pick up, a, pick up a knife than people might have done in another place in another time. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, of course, there's a kind of Islamic dimension to this, but there's also an American dimension. Yeah. There's also maybe a universal dimension that it's very easy to become famous by attacking art. John Lennon you know, didn't survive the same phenomenon. Yeah, but I mean, look, the, the value of human life has cheapened in recent times. And it's easier for people to conceive of ending a human life as a way of making a point, you know, and um, clearly that's a position which, with which I disagree. Clearly, clearly, yeah, clearly, yeah. Uh, you make that, <laughs> um, but, um, and you don't name your attacker. Uh, is that the same reason that we, we shouldn't give these, these sort of these types, people who think that it's um, a good thing uh, pointing out to, to end people's life uh, not mentioning them? 
Yeah, I, you know, first of all, I just just in a kind of emotional way, I didn't want his name in my book. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, I, can, and, I, can, um, I can see that point, of course, but yeah, yeah. And I also felt, you know, he's had his moment in the, in the limelight. He's had his half minute of celebrity. And now he should go back to being nobody and just spend the rest of his life in jail. Yeah. Uh, which um, uh, you are uh, uh, very explicit about that you hope that you spent most of his life in jail. There's this, I would say, a um, uh, uh, very poignant uh, uh, scene in, in your new book, in Knife, where you actually decide against the, the better counsel of, uh, uh, of your wife, Eliza, to, to go and visit the place where he's kept. Yeah, I went to have a look at the jail. Yeah. I just thought... I just thought I want to see where he is. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's a, it's a very banal, small jail, a little cell block and some a wall with some barbed wire on top of it. And um, it made me feel good to think he was in there and I was outside. Um, and uh, yeah, it cheered me up. <laughs> <laughs> It cracks the audience up here in Amsterdam as well. <laughs> um, then you, um, the uh, the book is in is in many ways the the book knife is in many ways it's about, um, and you describe that very accurate where you're saying it's about the worst sort of the the random cruelty which jago has in uh, the shakespearean jago the random cruelty and also the random goodness of people yes i mean i think uh, it's quite extraordinary how the audience behaved um on that day of the attack the fact that 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 they rushed forward uh to subdue the attacker yeah and and out of just a kind of uh, principle, I guess, that somebody shouldn't be killed in front of them and risk their own lives. And I think, yeah, I say in the book somewhere that it was as if I was being shown the worst side of human nature and the best side of human nature almost simultaneously. You know, and and uh, the memory I retain from it is the memory of the courage of those, peop those people not unknown to me, I don't know their names. I wouldn't recognize them if they walked in the room. And yet these were people who saved my life, you know, which which is uh, an extraordinary paradox to, to be, for those to be unknown to me. Um, but I dedicated the book to them, anonymous as they are. Um, you also say somewhere in the book that you're inclined to think that people are uh, uh, inclined to all sorts of evil because you were sort of surprised that you got back all the things you had in the inside of your jacket, you know, the keys yeah. and, and your card and your credit card and things like that. And uh, uh, that you that you actually like to be proven wrong about, you know, how people rob or don't rob. But it, overall, if you, after 35 years of thinking about assassins and attackers and and with this experience behind you overall what would you say uh, are you more um, inclined to see the good in people in humanity or less or is that sort of the same or is that uh, also in the no, light what you just described I think you know obviously this attacker represents an aspect of humanity that exists and it exists as you say in many places mm -hmm. and And, you know, one just has to recognize that that is a part of the world now. Um, but, um, no, I, I respond much more to the goodness that I was shown, um, both by the people at that moment, by expressions of support and sympathy and solidarity from all around the world, including, of course, from the Netherlands. And uh, very, I was very moved and strengthened and by those things and grateful for them and and you know actually with the exception of almost being murdered i have quite a good life <laughs> and, and, I, and and i've just tried to get get back to it really and and that is a life full of friendship and love and so of course that makes me feel good about humanity there's just this one little problem which which would be Well, I got the knife stuck in me 15 times. 
Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't call that little, but the knife is not that big. You describe all sorts of knives. <laughs> yeah, I don't, but, I don't know what the knife looked like. You know, it's a strange thing. Is everything happened at such speed that I was not able actually to get a good look at the at the weapon. So <laughs> I, I couldn't tell you what it looked like, whether it was big or small, but it was effective. That's for sure. And there's this wonderful passage where you describe the knife and sort of knives you had, and you had a Swiss knife before you, and that the knife in itself is not evil. It's just a thing which you could use for good or for bad. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and in that uh, way, if it differs from a gun. A gun only has one purpose, which is violence. Yeah. A knife can be used to cut a birthday cake or a wedding cake. You know, it, it, it can be used for happy things. Um, so it's a, it's morally neutral. You yeah. know, the, 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 the question is what use is it put to? Yeah, and you make a sort of, um, then you you move a little bit into language. That it's, mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of, the, and you describe it's almost the same thing, that, that language can do the, both be put to work good, for good and for bad. Yeah, I mean, I just thought, yes, that's obviously true. Language can be horribly misused. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it can be also very beautiful. Um, but, but what I felt is that if I wanted to fight back against this, this attack, I don't have knives or guns, you know, I don't use those things for uh, uh, what I have is language. Yeah. And, and so, I, so I came to think of writing, if you like, as my knife, you know, my, my way of, of fighting back. And I guess, you know, if you're going to be in a knife fight, you should bring a knife. And, and this, was, this was mine. So the book felt to me, I think the reason the book is called Knife is, well, there's two reasons, I think. One is the obvious reason, which is that it, it arises out of a knife attack. And, and, and the other thing is that I felt that the book itself is a knife. The book itself is, is if you like, my weapon with which to deal with this assault. Yeah, yeah, it's the answer. Or the, um, but you think that, um, aside from the fact that you <laughs> describe this book, maybe a little bit tongue in cheek, but maybe also true, tr tr truthfully, as a self-help book to regain your control, which you sort of, I read it as mockingly about yourself a little bit because you always said that these sort of books are not the books you want to write or you think are important. But be, be, beside that, um, how do you think that art can be an answer to violence? Well, just by existing, by existing and by, sh and by revealing, uh, by revealing the beauty of human, of human life as opposed to its ugliness. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you do. You answer ugliness with beauty. You answer violence with peace. Um, and I, I, I don't have a, a, a big philosophical theory about it, no. but I just thought, I just thought this is the way I can respond. And, and so that is the way I must respond because it would have seemed, it would have seemed odd to say, to write nothing about this. You know, it would have it would have it would have felt like kind of avoiding the most obvious subject. Yeah. And so, I, so in the end, I thought, well, I just have to take it on. You know, I have to take it. It's going to be a difficult book to write. It was a difficult book to write. Um, but I thought I have to, I have to have this find the strength to do it. What was difficult about? What was the most difficult part, or, or what was one of the most difficult parts of writing it? And the most, diff most difficult part was the first chapter, which is the chapter in which the attack is described in as much detail as I can remember. It's almost um, second per second. Eh? We, just, we, 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 we discussed this before you came on. It's, it's minutely. Yeah. yeah, so I, that was very hard to write because it was obviously revisiting a very bad moment. And... Um, it was written very slowly, a few sentences at a time, and with a lot of emotion. Um, 
once I'd finished that account, that description, it got easier to write. Uh, and and uh, it, I began to speed up. You know, and and uh, it, I, I was able to write more in, in a day and, and to be less to be less emotionally affected by it. So I think once I got past chapter one, the next seven chapters were easier to do. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 we, I, we can obviously see that, especially if just, I just read the book. Um, may I ask you another question? Because you've become as close to death as you could possibly get. Yes. Um, Probably hardly anybody here in the room has yet. Of course, we all we, we, we'll all get there. Um, it's um, we know that, but um, maybe I, I, I can I write a little passage from your book. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. It's page 18 in the English edition. I was pro it was probable that I was dying. So. What did it matter indeed? I didn't expect to need house keys or credit cards. Again, the, the, we just, just discussed them. They were in your pockets. But, but now, looking back, hearing my broken voice insist on those things, the things of my normal everyday life, I think that a part of me, some battling part deep within, simply had no plan to die and fully intended to use those keys and cards again in the future on whose existence that inner part of me was insisting with all the will it possessed. Some part of me whispering, live, live. Um, I think this is the moment where you were describe incredibly, you're almost dying. And I was wondering, <laughs> um, you having described yourself as an atheist in several occasions, I'm just wondering, <laughs> did this uh, moment give any shed any different light on it? Or is, is, or is, that, or is that just um, no, it, impossible it to ask? No, it, it strongly confirmed it. Uh, right. You know, because, I mean, I've rarely felt so physically in my body, you know, and, right. and, and there was no trace of a miracle. You know, there was no, no tunnel of light, no gates of hell, no heavenly choir. Um, it's just somebody lying on, a, on the ground, bleeding. You know, and, and it felt, it confirmed what I've always felt, which is that death is an ending. You know, it, it's not a gateway into some other thing. It's, it's just an ending. And that's what it felt like to me. And it also, I mean, the passage you read, I do believe that there is a thing human beings possess, which is a very, very powerful survival instinct. And, and at, that, at such moments, which hopefully very few of you will experience, when something happens which endangers you, the survival instinct kicks in. And, and, so, and so I was aware of this, this thing in my head insisting that I should live. But I don't believe it came from outside my head. I think it came from inside my head. Um, and um, so, yeah, no, I'm still as godless as I ever was. <laughs> yeah, you, you actually say so in the book as well. But this, this moment is just, you know, the closest, we, if we're in a personal conversation, we can get to, to this experience, which is a universal experience, of course, but we cannot, most of us cannot talk about it because we didn't live to talk about it. Haven't been no, yeah. I mean, it's true. Oh. In fact, I, when, I was, when I was discussing the early version of the book with my published my editor at Random House, um, he said to me, look, he said to me exactly what you've just said, which is that, which is that very, very few people get this close to it and then come back and are able to talk, tell the story. He said, so he encouraged me. He said, you've got to say more about it. There was much less about it in the, in the first version of the book. And he said, you ha he said, you haven't said enough about it. You have to say more. So then I did. <laughs> and I'm glad. I'm glad for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, the book is, um, well, and, and, and besides, it's, we're very lucky because you're able to 
actually say things. We're not all able to put these little things in words. You you are absolutely so. It's a again, it's a, a magnificent book. But the, just besides, <laughs> um, um, well, I've been I've been I've been practicing for 50 years. You know. <laughs> 22, 22 books, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this, yeah. Um, <laughs> you are uh, um, you are uh, a, a a novelist, a writer, and you um, uh, first and foremost, of course, um, a storyteller. And you've just bumped into um, uh, the thing that you that you had to become a. Uh, uh, a, a fighter for the for free speech and for these sort of sort of things. You just yeah. happened to bump into it, but um, uh, it was sort of, I, in my view, it was forced upon you to uh, to to write about these sort of things as uh, freedom of speech. But you, yeah, I mean, not entirely forced upon me because I was involved with that subject before there was any attack against my work. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I, I mean, I was uh, when I was living in in. In London, I was a member of English Pen, and uh, and and we had be, and I'd been involved in campaigns on behalf of various writers in in difficulty in in various parts of the world. So I'd been already engaged, you know, with that subject. Um, but obviously, it became much more immediate uh, after the attack on the Satanic Verses. And, and what I felt was that in those years, the sort of nine years or so, I was shown so much solidarity and support by the write, writing community uh, around the world uh, that, that when things improved for me, I thought it's time to return the compliment. You know, it's time for it, it's time to, as as so much was done for me to try and do things on behalf of other people who, who need who need support and need help. And so that's why it became uh, important for me you know, to to make that a part of my life. And yeah. it still is. It still is. Yeah, it still is uh, also in this book again. Um, mm. And you um, <laughs> you returned to the favor. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's a wonderful way of putting it. Um, actually, you were returning the favor the moment uh, that morning uh, of the uh, in, in in August, when you were yes. talk, talking about the necessity of safe places for writers in exile to to exercise their their trade. Their, their, um, yes, I mean, I, 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 the reason I was there at at the Chautauqua Institution was not to talk about my own work. No, you know, it, it was. Uh, my friend Henry Reese, who runs a project in in the city of Pittsburgh, uh, which is a, a city of an asylum city project, where which is al allied to this organization called the International Cities of of Refuge Network, that I was one of the people who was involved a little bit in starting it. Um, now more than twenty years ago, and Henry came to a speech I gave in Pittsburgh, like twenty two years ago in which I talked about this, this project. And he and his wife became inspired to try and join the project. And, and they, they initially had one house in, in Pittsburgh in which they housed a Chinese poet who needed a safe place. And then gradually they enlarged the project and now they have a whole little street of houses where they can put up writers in trouble and I thought uh, they've been doing it for 20 years. And the, the reason the event was happening was that the Chautauqua Institution wanted to celebrate Henry and his project and its 20th anniversary. So I said I would come in and celebrate it with him. So that's why I was there. Yeah. <laughs> Ironically, um, uh, <laughs> some people actually thought that it was sort of a, a staged uh, yeah. happening to point out how important it is that writers can be, can be free uh, and and with, live without fear. Yeah, I mean, Chautauqua is such a sleepy, pretty, peaceful place uh, that I think nobody in that audience was able to imagine that an actual act of extreme violence was taking place. You know, so, so they thought maybe it's a piece of theater. But but then it became rapidly clear that it was not. You um, you you wrote um, that. Um, you were actually dismayed in in a way that 
um, the satanic verses and part of your of your writing was dragged back into this uh, discourse of um, a fatwa and 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 the whole uh, Iranian or Ayatollah uh, discourse because you hoped that it would be um, by now free of that the writer and the, and the work would be free of it. Um, yeah. Is that a, re a, a regret after yeah. after the attack? Still? Yes, I, mean, I think because what had happened, you know, it's been such a long time. And and it, what had happened was that people had regained the ability to write about my work without always referring uh, to right. the attack on the Satanic Verses. So, so the last several novels that I published were written about and thought about without having to look back at that at that episode. And so so I felt I had actually got out of that particular narrative and back into the ordinary narrative of, of a writing life, you know, and and that felt good. And now, of course, because this has been such a, you know, a prominent event and such, such a big news story and so on, that it, that it, and actually by writing this book, I'm kind of making it worse. Um, I, it, it, I was going it, to it, ask, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, it puts, it puts that subject back at the front of people's minds. And um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm frustrated by that, uh, but I hope it won't stay in the front of people's minds for long and they can get back to reading novels. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the book is um, uh, about a murder attack. It's uh, uh, meditations after attempted murder. It's, it's called actually under the, under the title knife. Um, it's also a love story. Um, yes. Uh, it's uh, again. It's about brutality and it's about love. Uh, it's about good and bad in 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 human, in in in, in human conditions. Um, yes. And um, there, there's a passage which I thought was uh, uh, interesting and lovely, uh, where um, you describe that your wife is uh, hesitant to give um, her manuscript of her new book to you to read. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And you say something with it. You say that um, because we both know very well that uh, we can't have uh, uh, we can't have a, a, a marriage or a, a love affair if we don't like our w uh, uh, re reciprocal work, and not only like but think it's actually very good. <laughs> and yeah. then, and then you're. Um, then you, you read it and you're happy that you do actually really like her work. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, I, was scared. I was scared to read it too. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because what, I, because what do I do if I don't like it? You yeah, know? yeah. Um, and I'm very bad at lying about books. If I don't like them, it shows. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fortunately, fortunately, I mean, it is actually a really wonderful novel and um, it, and now has been recognized as such by many people, translated into many languages and so on. Um, and and um, that was very early on in our relationship. I mean, I had read her poetry, uh, which I thought was wonderful, but not all poets are able to be novelists. Um, and no novelists are able to be poets. Uh, so I thought crossing that boundary from poetry into fiction is not an easy thing to do. Um, but she did it beautifully, you know, and, and so it just showed me that this is a person who's able to do many things. I'm only able to do one thing. Which is writing. Which is writing prose. Mm -hmm. uh, she, I mean, she can write poetry and she can write fiction and she can write nonfiction and she can take photographs and be a videographer. And I mean, it's it's disgraceful, really. <laughs> I'm happy to hear so. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, did um, we were wondering whether your new book is a real Salman Rushdie in the old sort of in the 20, 21 books which were written before it or whether it's not um, because um, part of it is is a, a sort of a deviation from earlier styles you you use it's in many ways new i would say would would you say that you've been influenced by your wife um in no i no? just think this i've always felt that the subject determines the method you know that uh D depending what you have to write about, that 
that teaches you the techniques you must use to write about it. Um, so there have been books of mine which have been very ornate and fabulous and other books of mine which have been quite stripped down and realistic. I mean, like, you know, Shalimar the Clown, for example. Um, and it's, it's really the subject matter that dictates the techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's what you have to do as a writer. You have to find the, the, the form and language that fits the story you have to tell. And, and um, in that sense, it wasn't different than writing any other book, you know. Um, and I've, I knew quite quickly that it was a book involving three, three main characters, that there was obviously myself as one, and the, assa the assa would-be assassin was another, and, and my wife Eliza was the third, you know. And, and so, so I, I thought of the book as this kind of triangle, um, and at one corner of the triangle is me, and at the other two corners of the triangle are what you could call, what you could characterize as love and death, you know. And 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 I'm somehow involved in this, these two forces coming at me, one very positive and one very negative. And and I thought, well, okay, that somehow is the book, and I have to I have to find a way of of telling that, the story of that triangle, of those three people. Yeah, yeah. Though postponing sort of the moment in which the narrative about attacks and thought was... Um, and was that uh, is prolonged um, before we can all return to the wonderful world of the novel. Huh? Um, but you said it was obvious I, I earlier referred to this while well, we have been talking to each other now. Um, you said it was obvious to write, um, and you also say it was in sort of a self-help way to necessary to reclaim that story. Um, um, was that a, a joke about yourself, or was that are you are you serious about this? Or it's not exactly self-help. I mean, it's more like responding in a way that gives me that makes me feel that I'm making it my story rather than the thing that happened to me. Right. Um, that, you know, uh, that this, okay, this is, you know, it's, to put it bluntly, instead of being simply a man lying on the floor bleeding, I'm somebody writing a book about a man lying on the floor bleeding. And, and that makes it my property, you know, and, and, uh, that felt good. It just felt like a shift in the power relationship, you know, between between me and the killer. Um, uh, a shift in my direction, you know, and and um, it's more about that than 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 therapy. It's more about it's really more about power. Mm -hmm. Who has it? How can you take power away from the killer and give it to yourself? Yeah, yeah, that's very. Uh, con I, I, yeah, I can understand. That's very concisely said. But um, uh, and um, you refer back also uh, uh, in knife, but also in your memoir um, that you said that um, looking back at um, uh, the satanic verses, um, you actually thought that a religion which reacts as they did out of Tehran, uh, the way they reacted to your book, uh, which used these wonderful ancient stories. Again, uh, you wish you would have written a harsher book or a more critical book. And well, you well, that's something said. Uh, that's something I said on the day of the fatwa on CBS television. Yeah, yeah exactly. And then I mean, I, I was quite angry at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yes, and you had an, every reason to be so, of course, I would say. But um, you re reiterate that in uh, in uh, in Joseph uh, Anton, and yes. and you're saying, yeah, I'm, I still feel inclined to defend the book, uh, the writer and the book. Uh, you say about yourself, and would you yeah. still? That's that was uh, uh, after decades of being, you know. Uh, Prosecuted, you could say, but or at least you know. Uh, um, would you still say the same after this I think, book? I think, I think you know the Satanic Versus is doing fine. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's it's now been 
a long time since it was published. It's been continuously in print in more than 40 languages and is widely read, you know, and, um, and you know, many people like it. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't see why the opinions of people who like it are less important than the opinions of people who don't like it. Mm -hmm. uh, especially as the people who don't like it almost universally don't like it without reading it. Right, so they're the, the lesser critics, you would say, in that respect, because they haven't, yeah. haven't actually read it. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, yeah. I was, you know, in the, in the beginning, I used to get annoyed about the fact that so many people attacking the book were doing so without ever having taken the trouble to, to acquaint themselves with it. But then I thought, if you look at the history of the attacks on books, that's very often the case. You know, pe people who accused James Joyce's Ulysses of being pornography had, had quite obviously not read Ulysses, because while Joyce is a great writer, I don't think he's very pornographic. No, no. <laughs> he could have used a little bit maybe, but no, he wasn't. No. Yeah. <laughs> the people who accused Nabokov's Lolita of being the proof of the author being a pedophile had obviously not read what is an extremely moral book, you know, an extremely moral and very anti-pedophile book. Uh, so then I thought maybe this happens a lot, you know, that people who decide to take arms against a book only, can only do so by not reading it. If you read the book, maybe you have to have a more complicated view about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you don't like it, you know, even if you don't like it, you can't simply call it, you know, one sloganized negative thing, you know, pedophile, pornographer, blasphemer, whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that's uh, maybe the whole point of novels that you can't not make them into one sentence one or thing. one word. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very true, very true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember when we had a conversation, I think 20 years ago, you said, you know, blasphemy, though, is um, very important because if you look at, look at it, um, uh, Socrates, yeah. uh, Christ, and Galileo Galilei, all three of them were uh, on trial for blasphemy. For blasphemy. And, uh, you know, they just happened to be the father of uh, uh, philosophy, the father of one of the biggest religions in the world, and one of the fathers of the scientific tradition. Uh, yeah. uh, so that's, you know, three sort of schools of thought which are rather influential, <laughs> uh, yes. born out of uh, what people conceived as blasphemy. Yes, and I mean, I think um, I've always thought that, and I, and I also am aware of the fact that in the 18th century in France, during the Enlightenment period, uh, the, 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 right, the great writers of the Enlightenment, Montesquieu, Diderot, Voltaire, etc., they characterized, they knew that their enemy was more the church than the state. Uh, that that the, the ability of the church in that time to repress thought, you know, with, by the use of anathemas and excommunication and torture devices and so on, uh, you know, inquisition. Um, they understood that that was the enemy and that in order to achieve freedom of thought, you had to break the power of the church in limiting freedom of thought. And, and so blasphemy became a weapon, you know, um, a weapon in that struggle. And And broadly speaking, that struggle was successful, and that's why we have the modern idea of free speech. Um, so, yeah, blasphemy has its has a distinguished place in human history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just to name three three persons in history which are rather influential, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah and maybe four, yeah. Um, uh, you. Um, And that's a, it's a very good way of pointing out, um, you know, the, the importance of free speech, of course, and of and part of that is blasphemy, maybe, but the other parts are, are, are as important, maybe. But um, you, uh, in your um, in your memoir in uh, Joseph Anton, you start with sort of a scene of the crowds um, um, gathering, and first it's first it's just a bird, and it's and you look at it as an individual bird, but then it becomes a whole, it becomes a whole. Um, 
flock of birds and more and more and it becomes something of the phenomenon. And yeah. um, and you, in your uh, uh, long life, and, and you happen to be sort of a prefiguration, I could call it maybe, of uh, mm. a thing which is happening now rather all over the world. You know, you, you were one of the first people to meet sort of the, yeah. the intolerance of the times we're engaging in now. Yeah, I mean, I, the, in, in the, the metaphor of the birds obviously is from Alfred Hitchcock's movie. Yeah, yeah, it uh, is. The birds. And, and, and I say somewhere in Joseph Anton that what, what happened to me was like the first blackbird. Yeah. Um, and, and then later on, when the sky is full of angry birds, um, you remember that there was that first bird. Well, it was you um, in this case, yeah. Me. And I mean, I can recall, for example, after the 9-11 attacks in New York, um, friends of mine who were quite serious, well-respected journalists um, said to me, oh, now we understand what happened to you. Right, yeah. And I thought, I thought really, thousands of people have to die for you to understand what seems obvious? But that's not exactly what they were saying. What they were saying, really, was now it had happened to them as well. And, and obviously the 9-11 attack is something on a much bigger scale than what happened to me. Um, but the two things are connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, because you're just saying, you know, that um, Voltaire and Diderot and the Enlightenment uh, authors uh, understood that it's important to to um, carve out free speech uh, uh, from uh, uh, oppression. And, oppression, yeah. And yeah. but if we look at sort of the the last decades, and it might be 9/11, or it might be uh, uh, the events happening to you, or or the murder of Theo van Gogh, who, who a Dutch uh, intellectual, um, yeah. um, we're sort of getting in the. Th it seems sometimes that we're getting into more and more intolerant times, sort of uh, that it becomes more and more difficult to speak out uh, on the issues you think are important because uh, people are stifled either by violence or by uh, brouhaha in the press. Or um, mm. uh, Would you agree or is, is, is there... Yes, I think it's a bad time for free speech. I, 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 all, all around the world for different, not the, for different reasons in different places, mm -hmm. you know, but, but, um, but, uh, but what is consistent is on the one hand, you know, fanatics and authoritarians have always been enemies of free speech. And that's, that continues. But it's now also the case that liberals and progressives seem willing to restrict certain kinds of speech because they don't approve of it. Um, it's a rather strange phenomenon, you would think, as for a liberal or progressive. I mean, sort of contradiction, contra contradictionary. It's, it's, to my mind, unexpected because, and these are very often young people, very often, this, this is a phenomenon very often of a younger generation than, than mine, much younger generation than mine. Um, who believe for what they would believe to be virtuous reasons, you know, um, that 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 certain kinds of speech must be must be come behind the importance of social justice, that the the, the requirements of social justice justify censorship, um, and that's a more and more prevalent view. That if if somebody is offended by something, that is a sufficient reason to try to prevent that thing from existing. Uh, and so now you have pressure from both sides of the spectrum. You, you still have the, the traditional pressure from the right wing, um, but now you have it from the other side as well. It used to be that young people were iconoclastic and believed that anything could be said and should be said. Now, at least some young people, that's no longer how they think. And, and um, you know, people like me, we're old, we don't have that long to go. These are the young people who are the next generation. And I hope that they can learn that there is a danger in that point of view. Because censorship and repression of speech, historically, has always been used by the powerful against the powerless. 
always. And, and if you start using those tools, apparently on behalf of the powerless, so the powerless are doing the repressing, that's a very slippery slope. And, and if you establish that, then it's a dangerous precedent. How does one protest, just to use an American example, how does one protest against the American right wing trying to ban books from libraries? including the works of Nobel laureates like William Faulkner and Toni Morrison. How do you protest against that if you yourself are trying to ban other kinds of speech that you disapprove of? You know, so you weaken your argument by, by, by taking up those positions. And, and I hope people, to be frank, grow out of it. Mm -hmm. Because... Um... Uh, in the same vein, it's the fact that um, we are an art center here at the Bali, here at the Leidse Plan in Amsterdam. And mm. a lot of people, we have an editorial staff of 14 editors, all under 34. Um, and we are often pressed not to stage artists from certain countries who are... Um, uh, uh, looked up, uh, frowned upon, whether that be yeah. uh, uh, Israeli uh, filmmakers or novelists, whether that be Palestinian novelists, or uh, whether that be <laughs> that be uh, a Kurdish <laughs> a novelist, because um, um, and what would you what would you say to the young editors who <laughs> who are, are staging these people, you know, week after week? Why it's well, I, why it's important? I have always disliked the idea of cultural boycotts. You, know, um, you, can, you can see the argument for economic boycotts and political boycotts. That's a different thing. Mm -hmm. A cultural boycott serves nobody except the Philistine. Um, and in a way, you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Now, so uh, even in the days of the apartheid regime in South Africa when the when the there was a call for a cultural boycott there was yeah um, I didn't think that was a good idea I could understand why there should be a sports boycott because the because the the white supremacists in South Africa they love their cricket and their rugby football so if you if you deny them cricket and rugby football you get their attention if you if you refuse to have Writers connecting with South African writers, all you do is damage your own side. So, so I objected to it then. I mean, I, you know, I observed it because I was asked to, but I objected to it, and I object to it just as much now. Thank you um, for pointing that out again. Um, thank you for your wonderful book, Knife. Um, I, it is a strange thing to say, but I thoroughly enjoyed it because it's... Um, also, um, in a way, it's very voyeuristic. I mean, the, the journey to the moment just before the death of a, a writer you've been uh, reading for so many <laughs> years. Um, there's a whole whole of people here, uh, Mr. Rusty, um, yeah. full of uh, people who are uh, attentively uh, listening. And as we always do in the Bali, we ask the public to... Um, to ask a question. So if you're prepared yeah. to, um, if we could uh, uh, go ahead, then um, um, I'm thinking um, there might be questions. I'm looking at uh, Aziz Ainan for the first question. I don't know whether you have one, but uh, a famous Dutch writer here, we just discussed your uh, novel, <laughs> uh, Mr. Rushdie, uh, mm -hmm. a novelist born 1980. Uh, would you have one or would I put you on the spot <laughs> too much if I'm press pressuring you now? A lot of pressure. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have a question, but I really enjoyed the book. And um, uh, but, but there are so many people over here, and I think they have m much more better questions than me. But uh, thank you, Mr. Rushdie. <laughs> As you can, you can, th you can think about it for a moment. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed the book. That's the point, really. <laughs> uh, um, Rosalie, yeah, I can't reach you. There's. Um, Otherwise, Mr. Rush cannot hear you, so the, the, the microphone will come to you. Hello. Um, 
I'm Marjolein. Um, I'm a big fan and I, uh, I really have a question because I have a problem. And okay. um, 13 years ago, you helped me a lot. Uh, it was in Leiden at the free speech uh, thing. Um, and uh, I asked there whether uh, Salim still ha has a life out in your head without writing about it. And you assured me that he didn't. So I finally uh, uh, had a good night's uh, sleep. <laughs> But now, <laughs> so thank you for that. But uh, my problem is real. And um, it's with um, Kishot. And um, I, I really liked Victory City, but with Kishot, I have a problem. And it is, it reminds me of the way I felt when I read uh, Midnight Children. And um, because of it, with every sentence I write, uh, I, I read, I, I keep on thinking. You have to come to the question yeah, because there's um, other people. Is, no. Sorry. Um, I, I cannot read it uh, uh, at the first time again. Um, What's the question? I'm sorry. The question is, um, what would you advise me to do? I really like to read Quichotte, but I cannot mm. pass uh, a, a couple of sentences because I like it so much and I, mm. kept, I keep thinking, if I read it, um, how can I read it again? Uh, okay, you don't, you, you don't want to pass that sentence. Thank you. Yeah, so what should you do? Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help you. I think um, there's, there's another question over here. My advice I, is just finish, uh, finish the damn book. You know. <laughs> uh, yes, I would like to ask you. I'm Irina Snook. I'm from The Hague, and I would like to ask you: Do you think it's the right time for you to publish your book now? And I'm asking because once I saw David Grossman, who wrote about the loss of his son in yes. the uh, Land's End, of course you will know it. And I was thinking, is it good for you now or is it very difficult to give these interviews and does your wife say, oh, stop it? And, or is it a good time? Well, it's a, thank you. Uh, um, I didn't know how I would feel about the publication of the book, because clearly it would be necessary to do, in a way, what I'm doing here, which is to talk about that event again many, many times in many different countries and revisit it for, for a period of months. And, and I, of course, the great risk in such a thing is the risk of, of re-traumatizing, you know, of, of, of bringing back the pain. Um, and all I can say to you is it doesn't seem to be happening to me. Um, my wife finds it much more difficult. And, and actually, she doesn't listen to many of the interviews or read them. Um, one or two she's attracted to, but that's because of the person interviewing me rather than me. Um, <laughs> So if I'm on the Stephen Colbert show or the John Stewart show, she wants to be there. <laughs> but, in, but in general, she kind of steps away from it. Uh, on the other hand, she has written a very beautiful piece about how it felt to her, what, what happened. And I think that is going to be published in the Guardian newspaper next Saturday. Uh, and that was, I have to say, it was very painful for her to write it. Uh, and she she really found it very hard to write. Um, but now that she's done it, I think she feels good about having done it. You know? and, and me, I don't know, maybe I'm just much tougher than I think, because I'm not particularly bothered by going on talking about it. You know? I'm quite enjoying the conversation with all of you. So I think I'm just a hard nut, you know, and I don't crack that easily. Thank you for that question. Um, we will all be looking out for The Guardian uh, uh, next week. Um, there's a question over there. Um, the lady with the blue scarf. Um, Rosalie, can you reach her? <laughs> um, 
Thank you, Val. Thank you, Mr. Rashley. Well, you touched on the power dynamic. You try to sway your way mm. back writing this book. And I was wondering, and I sincerely hope the answer to my question is yes, but I am wondering about this. Um, physically, of course, you, you won. A coward came to kill you. You survived. Um, mm. You came back. He's in prison. We're all here having fun. So there, you won. But at the end of the day, after all the outpouring of support and the fact that you are still here with us, after all that's gone and you're alone in your own head, in your own psyche, do you actually, to yourself, feel like you, you won? Um, well, I mean, that's a very good question. Um, I think there's two things I would say that changed in me, which I wish had not changed. Uh, I, I, one is, I think, that a physical thing, which I think that even though I've recovered my health pretty much, I'm I'm not as I'm not as strong as I used to be. I'm I'm, I'm physically weaker, and and. Um, I don't know whether at the, with the passage of time that will improve, but at, at, the, at the moment I'm, I'm conscious of physical lack of strength. So, and, and I mean, that's a long-term damage and uh, there it is. I just have to accept it. The other thing I think is psychological. I think one of the things that happens, you know, I was being asked about close proximity to death. And I think when you have that experience of getting a really good close-up look at it, um, I mean, all of us will get there, but most of us don't have to spend our day thinking too much about it. Um, but when you've had that that look, in some way it doesn't leave you. you know? um, and, and I feel that there's like a shadow in the corner of my brain that that doesn't go away, which has to do with that too close acquaintanceship with the ending. Um, so those are ways in which I think I didn't really win, you know, that the, 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 the damage is lasting. But in other ways, I do feel, well, it's not a question of winning, I feel kind of free of it, you know. I feel as if, by, and writing the book has been a part of that freedom. Uh, that I feel I've, I feel I've sort of dealt with it, and I'm much more interested now in looking forward to the rest. You know, the rest of what remains. I mean, my wife and I have been planning my hundredth birthday party, which we have decided must obviously be a dance party, and we're trying to decide who will be the DJ. So that's where my attention is. I'm afraid we have only one question. Yeah. I'm afraid we have room for one more question. Um, and there's somebody really insisting that he should be... <laughs> <laughs> should be, uh, and rightly so, I mean... <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, shortly after the attack, uh, I read about it in the Irish Times, and yes. um, something I learned about you in, in this article was that you are a Tottenham Hotspur supporter. <laughs> this is, that, is my uh, Do you still have a relationship with them? That's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah, no, this is my personal tragedy. <laughs> and, I mean, I became a... Thank you for asking, thank you for asking the really important question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I became a Tottenham Hotspur supporter when I first came to England in 1961, and that was the year of the famous Danny Blanchflower double team, which won the league and the cup, and that is the last time they won the league, in 1961. So I've been waiting a long time. But yeah, I'm still, there you are, I've stuck with them. Nice stadium, need a team to match it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, <laughs> you've been waiting for it ever since, and that's, you know, uh, actually uh, w waiting for something to happen might be a more precarious uh, condition <laughs> than actually, you know, getting uh, the... Uh, I once made a documentary about 
the Palio and Siena, and there was a, mm. uh, a neighborhood, a Contrada, which waited, uh, uh, I believe, 42 years to be the next champion in the Palio di Siena, and they were still as happy <laughs> to go to that match every year. So yes, there's something in, in, in waiting and postponing uh, what, you're, what you're wanting to have. Um, Wonderful last question. I'm glad we uh, ended uh, uh, this very serious uh, uh, interview. I'm very, very uh, grateful for your time, uh, Salman Rosti. It has been wonderful uh, to, uh, uh, to speak to you. Wonderful that you uh, 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 wanted to come to the Bali. I'll bite I'm very you. happy to be with you. Very happy to be with you. And uh, thank you very much for your book. Um, uh, a warm applause for you. And <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Goodbye now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And hoping for our next novel, of course, returning to the to the course yeah. of the novels. You and me both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye, Mr. Rashid. <laughs> Oops,